are living. Um, since we're in this social distancing scenario, um, that's a part of church that we're really missing. So go ahead and feel free to introduce yourself in the comments right now. So Pete, what's helping you get through the quarantine? Why do I not talk? Oh boy. Um, it's been a struggle, I'm not gonna lie, but we've been going on long bike rides, which helps and walks and getting out of the house and playing in the yard seems to be the most successful um, opportunity for us. And I like playing games with them. We've got some new dice games we've been playing and- um, left and right. Yeah, left, center, right. Um, and it's been kind of funny, like the little things, like last night, Jordan stripped down and ate spaghetti and had like sauce all over his <clears throat> chest and was just really going at it. That made me giggle. Um, so hope you guys are able to get through the situation as positively as possible. If you have um, comments about how you're getting through quarantining, go ahead and leave them right now and let everyone read how you're um, getting through it. So on behalf of our Watershed community, thank you for spending time with us today. Do you guys want to say bye, Watershed? Bye, bye Watershed! Listen carefully. I'm out of toilet paper. So the kids just gather leaves. Everybody freaking out. Over every little sneeze. Breakfast at one, Netflix at two. Switch to Disney Plus, then try the Hulu. PJs and news, no one in the pews. Did even shower today. Quarantine life is the life for me. Finished all my snacks, so now I'm eating beans. Quarantine life is a life for me. It seems I only dream and eat ice cream in quarantine. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Fourteen days I've been on this farm. Only place to go is to the barn. Chips and salsa are almost gone But at least I got dressed and have real clothes on I got four kids in the all-star crazy yeah. Scared to look at my walk to want a quarantine, baby No Quarantine life is the life for me My kid won't stop saying I want to watch Pippi on the TV Quarantine life is the life for me Come on now Social distancing with me ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I was almost 33 When I learned the quarantine Was not the tasty chocolate stuff My mama made for me to drink No Hugging, no touching, not even fist bumping. Now we're all just going around the house rumbling. Six feet apart, and Corona's to blame. It gave bats a bad name. Been so long here in my living room. So just set up my knitting club to me up on Zoom. Meet up on Zoom. Quarantine life is the life for I wanna go out with friends and maybe have a dream. Quarantine life is the life for me. Tiger King is on the TV. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. When the barriers are lifted. When the fear of touch is gone I'm gonna hug you like there's no tomorrow I won't ever wanna be alone Amen Good morning, Watershed. Happy May! I'm coming to you from my backyard here in Plaza Midwood sitting under a tree 
and so excited to be here with you this morning. At this point on a Sunday morning, typically I would be in greenhouse, wandering the halls, hugging parents, asking how your week was, watching our volunteers interact with our kids and smile and laugh. Or I'd be sitting at a table with one of our greenhouse kids, listening to them tell me what their favorite parts of their week were. I am really, really missing hugs right now. I'm missing your faces and your laughs and your smiles. I'm missing watching you walk through the hallways with your kids probably running ahead of you and you catching up to them. I am going to be so excited whenever we come back together. I'm drinking out of my one of my favorite coffee cups this morning. And as you see, there's, there's a heart and it's missing. And so this cup is actually pretty symbolic of how I'm feeling right now. I haven't been part of our community for long. But even the, the few months that I have been here and the few weeks that I was there in person, my heart feels a little bit empty without seeing all of you on Sunday mornings. Speaking of Greenhouse, we're actually doing some pretty fun stuff. We just started a new series called Rabble Rousers. Well, let me add you, Peaceful Rabble Rousers. And it's actually based on our conversation we had with Andre Henry last week, where he talks about the first step in you know creating this different world is actually to figure out what well, what do we want it to look like so our kids are working on that and we are actually using one of our favorite books in greenhouse it's called holy troublemakers and unconventional saints this book is written by Denine Ackers so I would encourage you if you don't have it you should order it if you have older elementary kids especially um, but it's fun it's full of historical people who have kind of ruffled the feathers of the systems and of societies and they're all over the globe and so I'm excited for our kids to jump into that. If you want to be part of that with us you can also watch. We just go live at 9 30 on our Greenhouse Facebook page or it's posted there throughout the week so if you can't watch on Sunday morning at 9 30 maybe you like to sleep a little bit later then you can watch it anytime during the week and it's just full of silly videos with our kids and families um, story times, maybe some yoga, maybe some crafts. We even have cooked a few times. So you never know what you're going to see whenever you, whenever you hop over to Greenhouse and hang out with us. It's not just our kids that are having a good time. Our students are also having a good time. They have been having Netflix watch parties together on Sunday evenings and some during the week. But this Sunday, they're gonna change it up. At 7 p.m., they are going to be doing a Shed Students game night. So for all of our students, middle school and high school, get ready, get your A game on, and show up so that you can play games together online. If you have any questions, you can contact David at watershedcharlotte.com or you can go online to our website and just check the app or website on the Shed Students page. Part of the beauty of us gathering together online is that we have actually had some people join us that maybe have not been able to in the past. We have had some, um, some of you that have jumped in that maybe you're newer to Watershed and you just kind of want to know more about what's going on. So we want to invite you to something we're going to do this week called Shed 101. And it is actually going to be tomorrow night. Monday, May 4th, they're going to do it at 8 p.m. And it's going to be with our two co-founding pastors, Matt and Scott. So if you're interested, then click on the link and reserve your spot so that they'll know you're going to be there. I had the opportunity this week to serve with a, a team of 10 people that went to the Second Harvest Food Bank and packed boxes. And so we, we packed this week and it was tough because we all had on masks, but it was one of the most beautiful things that I've experienced so far as as being part of this community. I, I did feel like I worked out solid for three hours and I, I wasn't super sore the next day, but there's a chance that I could have been. Those people that were walking up and down and up and down and up and down and packing boxes, they, they probably were a little more sore the next day. 
it was just a great experience. And we are actually going to try to to put a team together for May 13th. So Wednesday, May 13th. Like I said, it is during the middle of the day. It's a three hour slot from 1 to 4 p.m. We filled 11 boxes that filled 11 pallets, which was 858 meals for the North and South Carolina areas that are in need of those meals. So that went to 858 families that are having a hard time right now. Thank you to those who served. I was honored to get to serve alongside of you. And for those who want to experience that, the more the merrier. Go ahead and get signed up. There were some teenagers there, so I know that um, teenagers can help as well. So maybe this is something you guys want to do as a family. It was very organized. Everybody had masks. They gave you gloves. Everything felt very, very safe. So if that's something that you're looking for a place to be generous and to serve and to plug in during this pandemic, then that is a good spot. We would encourage you to go ahead and email David david at watershedcharlotte.com to reserve your spot. I remember one of the first pastors that I worked with whenever I jumped into ministry said, if our church were to close, would our community notice? And so this is one of those times that I think, I think deeply about that question. Because the thing is, is that I do think our community would notice if Watershed were to close its doors. I do think our community would notice if Watershed had not been part of the community during this difficult time. So thank you to you all. Thank you for delivering meals. Thank you for giving toilet paper, food, supplies that we've asked for. Thank you for walking alongside your neighbors that we don't even know about. You guys have gone above and beyond to be generous and we are so thankful that we get to be part of that with you. So as a team, we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for going that extra mile. Thank you for maybe these one-time gifts that you keep sharing with us that make what we are doing so meaningful in this city and in our communities that are here. We wanna encourage you to stay the course, to keep giving, and to continue to be generous in the midst of this unknown and uncertain. Hey, Watershed community. I am excited to be with you guys on May 10th for the Cabin Fever series. Don't know about you guys, but I'm experiencing a bit of that. Um, anyway, I wanted to read a little excerpt from my new book called Rage Against the Minivan um, that is talking about faith and how Christians sometimes have a difficult time um, processing that sort of messy middle when we're in the middle of difficult times. Um, and I'm, I'm sharing about an experience that I had um, when I was starting my family, trying to have children, um, and was experiencing multiple um, pregnancy losses. Christians don't like to sit with the idea that sometimes God doesn't save us from our pain. And when that inevitable happens, because pain and suffering are part of the human experience, we have a crisis of faith. Here is the sticky thing about Christians and pain. Tragedy and suffering are bad press. If you didn't grow up Christian, here's a peek backstage. We love a good redemption story, but we hate the messy middle. We want the story to come to a redemptive conclusion. We want to wrap it up in a pretty bow. Sure, you might have been in pain, but then Jesus. We want to point to the place where God pulled us out of our pain, but when we couldn't find our way out of it, the narrative doesn't work. Why won't God save us from suffering? For what it's worth, this narrative around God saving us from suffering isn't something the Bible promises. Nonetheless, we believe it. I thought that this was a timely topic right now because I know that a lot of us are living with pain. And, we're, and if we're not living with it directly, we're watching it happen all around us. Um, I think probably most of us know someone who's lost a loved one to COVID. Um, if not, you know, even just the realities of regular life. We've, we've lost jobs. We have kids who've um, had major, major disappointments. Um, we are trying to balance home life with distance learning, with a job. Um, and I think many of us are going, where is God in this? And 
what is the story here? And um, we might even be trying to make meaning of this preemptively, you know, that God is doing this or using this. Um, and so I want to talk about that tendency for us as Christians to look for that redemption story, maybe when it's too early, um, and how we as Christians can learn to live in that messy middle, and how we can learn to actually, rather than have a crisis of faith when God doesn't come in and save everything, when God doesn't pull us out of pain, how we can move from feeling a crisis of faith in those moments to actually strengthening our faith in those moments, um, and what God does and doesn't promise us around pain. Um, I'd love to talk about that. And then as we're um, looking forward to Mother's Day, I'd also love um, to chat with you guys just about motherhood, about um, what that is looking like for so many of us in this, in this time. Um, I think never before have we had so much face time with our children. Um, and it is both um, a huge challenge, but also a unique time. So would love to talk with you guys about that as well. Um, looking forward to it. Oh, gentle heart, oh, simple soul, you have come so far. Turn back to not lose hope. Who can say how far is left to go? And all the nights you walked alone, you follow lights to guide you.
Hey, how's everybody doing? Uh, this is Matt. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Watershed. If you're new with us, thanks for joining us. I am here with uh, my partner in crime this morning, David Roberts. Say good morning, David. How you doing, man? Good morning, David. Uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing well. It's uh, good to be here, and I'm really excited about uh, who we're going to be talking to this morning. I am super excited. Um, there's a little bit of some, a little bit of some context. I think would be. Uh, worth creating or naming uh, before uh, Pete joins us. Peter Rollins is our guest this morning. We've been kind of bantering back and forth with with Pete for the past few weeks. And just to kind of give you some context, um, several years ago, I Scott and I attended a conference called, I think it was called Preachers, Poets, and Prophets. I'm not sure that's the right order of the, the words, but it's the first time we were introduced to Pete Rollins. And it was such a mind-blowing experience. It sort of sent us in on this trajectory of reading a lot of his material and kind of experiencing some of his ideas. Uh, I tell people that Pete Rollins is a little bit like a dirty little secret at Watershed, or at least it was for years, uh, because we were reading some of his thinking and really did not know what to do with it. It was very destabilizing, very disruptive. And it was sort of this thing you just you couldn't turn away from. You just kept looking at it. And only over the last probably four years have you started to hear some of his thinking surface either in a sermon or through a quote or some sort of video. And so um, I'm really excited to finally get to introduce you to this, this person who's authored numerous books, has been uh, communicating internationally for years now. And I know, David, you've been following him as well. Yeah, yeah. I've been a huge fan of Pete's for a number of years. Um, his work has influenced my own thinking and my own kind of spiritual journey and evolution. Um, and I, I guess I just kind of want to warn people, uh, kind of leading up to this, like, like you said, Matt, we've had this robust kind of back and forth via email with him in the weeks leading up to this. And there is so much ground that I feel like we want to cover. And, and my experience with Pete in the past is that, you know, when you wind him up, he just goes. And so just to forewarn you all before we dive in, before we, you know, invite Pete in, uh, this conversation could, uh, could go for a while, could go long. Uh, but fortunately Pete comes, uh, pre-equipped with this wonderful idiosyncratic uh, Irish accent. That's just going to make it real easy to just listen to him uh, kind of pontificate. He's kind of got this eccentric genius energy about him. So uh, so just to give you a heads up, stay with it because I'm sure um, the ground that we're going to cover is going to be amazing. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, let's invite Pete in. Yeah, let's get him in here. Pete, how are you doing this morning? Thanks for joining us. I'm assuming you're still in California. I am indeed. and I'm doing well. I'm very excited to... Uh be doing this uh, conversation with you guys. Um, I was just saying to you before we started recording that uh, you've really, you really done a lot of work to understand what I'm about and what I'm doing. And like, cause one of my greatest fears, like the only thing I fear most, more than not being understood is being understood. And uh, I think you guys kind of understand what I'm doing. So I'm in fear and trembling, looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and I, what, what's going to be interesting, I think, is a lot of folks in our community have already been introduced to so many, so many of your ideas in like these short snippets of either a sermon or a quote or some of the introductory experiences that we have within our community. So it'll be fun, uh, not just watching them interact, you know, kind of in the comment section as this is happening, but in the aftermath of this, maybe on a, on a, on a Tuesday night, we always do kind of a follow-up uh, group gathering. So I'm just, I'm really excited about what this is going to create. We're just to create a little bit of context for you, Pete, and I know you're aware of some of this, but we're a community that's right around 15 years old. Uh, our origins are sort of in this conservative mainstream evangelical flow. Uh, at least that's how, uh, our roots begin for me personally and Scott as, as well. And a lot of folks here who, who are still showing up, we're in the South. So, you know, that's hard to shake uh, no matter where you've been or, or what you've gone through. And so there's been several iterations of who we are, I suppose, sort of these um, for lack of a better term, maybe uh, developmental or evolutionary clicks in terms of who we are as a community. And, um, to be real transparent, there have been seasons where we're really not sure what sort of language to use to even describe us, yeah. uh, or uh, we're not sure how we feel about some of the labels that are used to describe us. In fact, 
Um, sometimes people will tell us, well, I found you by going on Google, found you guys going on Google, and I'll ask, well, what did you type into the, the search engine? And they would they say, well, progressive church. And so that, that pops up and we pop up. And so we've in, at times embraced that label and then at times not really been sure what to do with it. I, I know that following some of your work, that idea of being a progressive church or someone who sort of adheres to some sense of progressive spirituality. Um, there's some things around that idea that you find a bit disruptive or worrisome. Could you, can we start there? Like, could you unpack that term in terms of how you're working with it these days and trying to understand it and what you're talking to people about around that idea? Absolutely. Uh, you kind of, you want to jump right into the tough stuff. <laughs> um, it's, and it can sound very strange when people hear me uh, talking about progressivism and liberalism and having critique. Um, at first, that can sound strange because people maybe assume that I'm coming from a progressive place. Um, and then often when you hear that, your only context is to think, oh, am I saying something very conservative then if I'm not progressive? Um, but uh, I'm, I want to kind of tease that out a little bit. Um, and of course, we can't get too far, but uh, let's start with um, try to get to the essence of what progressivism is. So can I talk a little bit about maybe one of the key elements of progressivism, and then I can maybe contrast it with the approach that I take that's more influenced by Soren Kierkegaard and a tradition called dialecticism. Um, so progressivism, you can think of it in terms of religion. You can think of it in terms of politics and economy. You can think of it in terms of philosophy. Uh, you know, there's three different buckets you can put a progressive in, but they all interlink to a certain extent. All roads lead to room. So whichever one we start with, we'll generally come to, or we will come to the same underlying presuppositions. And one of the presuppositions of progressivism, I argue, is the idea of progress. So that's a bit of a shock. Who would have thought <laughs> that um, the, 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 the secret's in the name? And by progressivism, I mean the idea that society can move along towards greater and greater uh, wholeness, uh, can increasingly get rid of contradictions and deadlocks and antagonisms within social reality, moving gradually towards what we could call an amiga point after the Teilhard de Chardin, but a, a kind of like a gradual movement towards greater and greater peace and oneness and wholeness that we currently lack. Now, you can parse that out in terms of those who say that we experience antagonism and conflict in the world, but that's an illusion and we have to see through that illusion to see how we're all unified. Or you can say that that division is real and there are real conflicts and real things that need to be removed from our society in order to find that wholeness. But in general, I would say progressivism is about this uh, movement into the future, a kind of eschatological movement towards a type of utopia, even if the idea is we never quite get there, right? It's this onward movement. So do you want to ask anything about that? Or do you feel that that's a, that, that makes sense as a definition? Yeah, it does, um, at least to me, I guess, uh, to clarify mm -hmm. potentially for our people. So you kind, of, um, you kind of named two trajectories right there about how, how maybe a religious tradition might pursue this notion of wholeness or, or progress. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about one wherein it's, you know, the antagonism is an illusion. And all we have to do is like pull back the curtain and realize that all of us are already really whole or one. So there's one. And then the other one is this idea that, you know, maybe things were good and now an antagonism is introduced and then somehow it needs to be overcome, whether through reconciliation or exclusion or so on and so forth. And so um, I've heard in other contexts that you've maybe oversimplified, but, but, but you, 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 you've kind of categorized this. One of the, one of these is kind of more the Western tradition. Yeah. And one of these is kind of more, the Eastern tradition. So maybe, maybe just to give people some practical context for how maybe this plays out in spirituality, uh, talk a little bit more about, about that breakdown. 
Absolutely. So, and so that's, that's a very important distinction. I mean, in reality, as you say, it's a simplified distinction, but it's a good way to initially get your head around it, is that the, way, the religions that we tend to think of as in the West, or kind of the, the religions of the book, let's call them Islam, Judaism, Christianity, are more religions of uh, what's called an ontological rupture, so a real uh, antagonism. That exists. Ontological, like like in, in your being, in your being, yes. in your person, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So in philosophy, ontology means the nature of reality. So in reality, there is a rupture and antagonism. And then in more Eastern traditions, but well, let's talk about the Western Eastern traditions: psychedelic enlightenment, higher consciousness meditation, sexual enlightenment, uh, are a few of them. But they're more tend towards we are caught in a veil of illusions. And the antagonisms that we experience in our lives and in social reality are simply a type of illusion that we have to see through. Yeah. But ultimately, they both kind of land in the same kind of thing. They're both, uh, broadly speaking, talking about a wholeness and a oneness that we've fallen from in some way and that we want to return to uh, through certain practices or drugs or whatever yeah certain okay. ideas so go uh, ahead I'm sorry go ahead no please go ahead david i was gonna say so that sounds good you yes know, <laughs> you know wholeness and oneness you know obviously there's you know you know there's maybe a reason why this is has you know stood the test of time over the course of human history but you yeah. want to problematize this a little bit and and you've even used you know the the language of the gospel the language of the good news is, is, you know, I, I've heard you kind of use a, almost a play on that idea and kind of say, you know, this isn't actually good news. The good news is actually, I don't know if you've said the good news. Culture, is chaos, craziness. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, 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 so yeah. pretend I'm not someone who's already kind of excited about where I think you're going to take this. Mm. Uh, you know, sell, sell us on this. Like, what, what, you know, why, why, why should we not be excited about the pursuit of wholeness? This, this is a harder sell, right? Um, in, in the work of someone like Soren Kierkegaard, uh, he is working with the philosopher Hegel. And I'm gonna paint a picture of their kind of view of reality and then I'll try and unpack it. Is that we, we progress in, in life by solving contradictions, right? We, we come across uh, our love and our hatred of someone at the same time, a parent or a spice or whatever and or we come across a confusing thing with the natural world and as we try to make sense of it we make progress and so life is a series of encountering deadlocks and apparent contradictions and apparent problems and then trying to solve them and and progressivism says that's progress as we hit problems and we solve them we move forward for for someone like hegel it's it's different uh, and it's, it sounds weird at first. It's like when you hit a contradiction, uh, when you, you solve it by deepening it. You actually don't get rid of it. You bring it to a higher level. And actually movement involves bringing up contradictions and uh, finding that they lead to even deeper contradictions and even deeper questions that lead to even deeper contradictions. And actually the journey you're taking is, is deeper and deeper into chaos. You kind of think you're trying to get away from the chaos, but you keep going deeper into it until this moment in which you discover that a type of antagonism is part of reality, that we're trying to get rid of an antagonism. We're trying to, to, to expunge it from the world, to treat it like a demon that we exorcise from existence. But what we end up discovering is that reality itself has a type of not at oneness within itself. It, it, reality is in a play with itself, in an antagonism. And when you come to the point of realizing that, then you come to the place of the cure or salvation or healing. You come to a place of peace. Uh, now, I, we, we can expand on that. Is there anything you want to say well, about that first? May, may I? No, like you're, wow, this is, I'm not really sure what, what I want to say next, because I know it's going to launch us into something, but what I'm hearing in that, um, that, that realization to, to refuse to, to, to go inward or to keep 
turning back towards the contradiction or the disruption. Uh -huh. um, the, the, the alternative to that, and, and correct me if I'm not hearing this correctly, is to either just sort of resolve yourself to this, well, futility, I can't really change anything, or you have to find somebody to blame. There's, there's a notion of casting blame on this other group, this other person, this other way of existing in the world. And, and I know you've talked some about the idea of scapegoating. Is that, how does that play into what you're saying when, when you say go inward and, and begin to try to reconcile the, 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 the unattainable pursuit of wholeness? Does, yes. does that question even make sense? It does. And, it, and, and, and the, the idea of scapegoating, the work of René Girard, this all, all begins to fit in. Um, can I give you actually a concrete example of what it looks like first, and then we can jump into that kind of stuff? Please. Because it might be fun to um, uh, actually see this work out in practice. So in practice, take the example of you are grinding your teeth at night. You're grinding your teeth. Uh, doctors can't really help. You're wearing something at night to stop you from doing it. Um, but eventually you think, you know what, I, I'm going to go to a psychoanalyst. And maybe your life's not going quite the way you want it to go. And the psychoanalyst says, well, what if this grinding of your teeth is a symptom? Now, just to define a symptom very quickly, a symptom is a congealment of a contradiction. So a symptom is the congealment of conflictual desires within you. So perhaps, for example, you're grinding your teeth because you want to shout at your boss, but you also know that you'll get fired if you do, so you keep your mouth shut. So the contradiction of wanting to shout and wanting to keep your mouth shut is manifesting physically in your body as you clenching your jaw. And as you talk about this, you're like, oh my goodness, yeah, this, this contradiction, this symptom that I have is really about me being angry with my boss. So the contradiction is deepened. So now we're in this thing about your boss. But then you might find that you go, oh yeah, actually my, my anger at my boss is actually a frustration with my partner. I, I'm, I'm angry and frustrated at some things that are going on in our lives, but I'm also scared of saying them because maybe we'll break up or maybe it'll destroy our lives. And so that deepens the contradiction. And then you go to, oh, this is a replaying or a repetition of my relationship with my family, my parents when I was a child, right? So that's even deeper. And you keep going in this journey of deeper and deeper contradiction until you get to the point of, of where you go, oh, actually to be human is to live in the contradiction of conflictual desires, of, of having to figure out you know, how to navigate a world in which what Camus calls the absurd, where we don't get everything we want. And actually, that's a good thing. And so this is a journey in deeper and deeper into contradiction. That's, a, that's an opposition to most counseling, a lot of therapies like ego psychology or cognitive therapies that are designed to get rid of the antagonism, that are designed to uh, kind of adapt you to your world, to integrate you into your world, to allow you to find containment within the world. Psychoanalysis, it's existentialism as well. Existentialism and psychoanalysis are, are ways of where you kind of weirdly always are trying to get rid of the contradiction, but you go so deeply in until you're free and you're free by accepting the contradiction. And so it's interesting because I think there's a, there's a, there's a um, sort of, I don't know if remnant is the right word, but sort of a, a a hive of people that might say at Watershed, um, you know, the, the teachings of Christ or the, the, the Christian tradition or narrative is irrelevant because um, you're, everything, you're already whole. Everything is, you just got to go inward and then you'll feel good about yourself or, you know, sort of like this Zen sort of uh, hyper spiritual way of seeing the world. And then there's an, another sort of group or another expression that want the, the solution. They want the answer. And the, the, the Christian tradition is what provides them the answer. And, you know, when you're, when you're talking, I'm, I'm, it's like I'm, these things are surfacing for me. For instance, when Paul talks about the inability to really do what he, he knows he should do or, or, or uh, will do things that uh, he, he knows that he shouldn't, and it's, it's this, this crisis, this conflict. And in, in my previous 
religious expression, it, you're, you're, you're searching for the answer that Paul is giving versus seeing the dilemma that maybe in the first century he didn't have the language for. And, you know, my experience, and, and again, you, you're one of the people that have sort of ruined me in this, is when I start hearing what you're saying, I'm noticing this happening across the, the time uh, continuum, the, the spectrum of history where people are wrestling with ideas or conflict or war or what it might be. And they're, they're needing an enemy or they're needing someone to blame. And really it's, they, maybe they didn't have the language for some of this. So I, I don't know if there's a question in there. It's just an observation that's surfacing for me. Um, so yeah, I'll just yeah. stop there and, and, and let you, let you talk. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, this is, um, this is, this gets down to how, how to read the biblical text as well. Like, uh, this has a, a radical, kind of a, a way of, of reinterpreting everything that's, that's been going on in the text. I think Paul the Apostle is very much talking about exactly what you're talking about. Paul has this idea of yeah, you try to obey the law, but it's the very obeying of the law that makes you guilty. And there's, there's this dialectic, again, between obeying, obeying the law and this this inability to obey the law. So you find it within the text. I'll, I'll, um, can I give like a, a brief overview of how I see um, uh, the kind of the, the trajectory of the, the biblical text in relation to what we're talking about. You have you have this dilemma right at the beginning of the text, and the the answer is right. How do we how do we um, how do we resolve this? Because you're either depressed, which is the sadness of not getting what you want, or you're melancholy, the sadness of getting what you want. Right you're in this disaster, <laughs> which is how we experience life. Um, within the model that we're talking about. And, and if you imagine we're all trying to be like God, so within the Christian tradition, we want to be like God. We want to imitate Christ, right? So what does that look like? Well, you imitate God, traditionally the one who lacks the lack, who's whole and complete. But then in the story of Christianity, God becomes human, so fully human. And then God experiences God's own self-alienation. So on the cross, God says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we identify with God and we see that God experiences a lack. And because we've symbolically identified with God, then we are drawn back to looking at our lack. We are able to embrace that as part of our faith. And that's what leads to transformation. And the opposite of this, this brings back to the question of the good news of Christianity, is if the good news is you can get rid of the lack, you can be whole and complete, it's bad news because it never works and you have to find an opposition, someone in the world who you want to get rid of in order to make the world great, right? And so whether you're on the right or the left, you, you make some enemy that if only they didn't exist, then everything would be wonderful. And you are caught in this fantasy of wholeness. So that's the reduction of contradiction to opposition. Whereas when you're able to, like AA is a great example of this, embrace and experience your own lack and make peace with that lack, um, then you will not uh, be this evil force in the world trying to rid the world of some group. You know, um, If I can say just one final thing on that. This is the difference between payment of sin and forgiveness of sin, right? So what is sin, right? Sin is nothingness, lack, right? It's not like being evil or chewing gum or, you know, going out with girls you do or whatever, right? Um, original sin means original lack. There's a sense of a lack, right? Now, what is a lack? In philosophy, there's two types of nothing, right? There's nothingness that's nothing. And there's nothingness that's something, right? <laughs> what, what's that mean? Well, there's a difference between not talking to your partner and not talking to your partner, right? We all know that. There's a difference between waiting for someone in a cafe and they're not there and another person who's in the cafe who doesn't experience the lack. So if, you're, if, if a friend of yours is 10 minutes late, you experience the lack, whereas everybody else in the cafe is also lacking the person, but they don't experience it, right? So money is a good example as well. Having no money is a, is a nothingness. Having debts is a nothingness that's something. Having debts means that you have to do jobs that you hate. You have to try to repay. You're getting you know, letters and phone calls. It's horrible, right? Now then, if I pay a debt, I fill the lack. So say I owe you $100 and someone pays the debt. They fill the, the nothingness with $100 and they dissipate it. 
just kind of an illusion for today, right? If I forgive a debt, I don't fill the debt, I render the nothingness nothing, right? Very, very different. So the year of Jubilee was not the payment of debts, it was the forgiveness of debts, right? If you have a theology of payment of debt, you have a theology in which you can fill the lack, you can get rid of it, right? If you have a notion of the forgiveness of debt, you have this notion that you can render the lack into something in which it, this thing is robbed. You can, the yoke of your lack is light. <clears throat> you can bear it. And that's what I'm talking about. Forgiveness of debt is a very, very complex concept within Christianity. And there's so many, <laughs> so many ways that I almost kind of want to now, you know, you know, like tangent off or rabbit trail or stuff like that. I told you, um, by the way, I saw your quest. I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a deep quest. I'm impressed at your community. I'm hoping your community's into this. But I'm impressed that they're into this. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, but, so one thing, just thinking practically um, yeah. about this. So, so, you know, this idea, cause you, you know, you talked, you know, the left and the right and both of them, you know, um, you, you know, one might see themselves as conservative and one might see themselves as progressive. But at the end of the day, they're both trying to pursue this wholeness, you know, you know, you know, getting rid of the group or the person or the individual that's causing the antagonism, so on and so forth. And so it, you, you paint almost this beautiful picture of, of not reconciling the antagonism, but sort of like reconciling yourself to the antagonism and, and making peace with it um, being there, not necessarily... Um, uh, getting rid of it or overcoming it, but, but, you know, making peace with it, um, which sounds great, but then practically speaking, what do we do with injustice? Yes. What do we do, you, you know, what do we do with, with, with systemic racism? What do we do with, you know, some of the, the debt and the wealth disparity that you alluded to a moment ago? What do we do with misogyny and, and things like that? And so um, how do we, how do we, how do we hold intention you know the need to the need to address injustice while at the same time avoiding the the, the ever slippery temptation to, to scapegoat in order to achieve justice yes see that's so this is this is key right and this this requires obviously an understanding of what do we mean by and let's use the term evil right well it's like something that is um fundamentally humanly destructive so like there's animals eat animals etc cetera, etc cetera. but when we're talking about what Freud calls death drive, when we talk about what's the, the peculiar type of uh, uh, evils that, that human beings are involved in, right? We have to understand where, we have to ask ourselves, where does that come from? Because um, it's very different from, let's say, the animal kingdom, right? And again, it'll be too hard to kind of like unpack this in a, in a heavy way, but just to give an introductory, an introductory notion is if, human evils are connected to this inability to embrace contradiction. <clears throat> if uh, human evils are to do with an attempt to scapegoat others, to say they're the reason for the problem, uh, <clears throat> if we fantasize that other people have the thing that we want, they're whole and complete and we're not, and so we want to get what they have, then it's actually this inability to embrace the lack that lies basically at the roots of all sorts of evils that we see today. <clears throat> Sorry. So that, take fascism as an example. And I, I don't think that fascism for me, I'm talking about in the traditional sense. So we're, we go back to maybe uh, Nazi Germany. What's going on with the fascist? Well, in fascism, there is a desire to return to the earth, uh, you know, lack of abstraction, uh, you know, suspicion of technology. Um, it's an attempt to um, uh, find a type of wholeness and unity. So if you, you read Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's always talking about organic wholeness. He's always talking about kind of this type of unity that he's seeking, right? And then there is a, a group that disturb the unity. And for that's the Jewish community, right? So if only we got rid of them, then everything would be fine. But it, within fascism, it's the opposite. It's the, it's the figure of the Jewish community that holds it together. The, the Jewish community is the scapegoat that, that hides the lacks and the antagonisms that are within the fascist community. So in a way, they're, in, so they're invested in having the Jewish community. They need the enemy that they hate. 
that's why the figure of the Jew, this notion, becomes like disconnected from any empirical Jewish individual. It becomes, you know, so wide because it has to remain. It's the thing that holds you together, even though consciously you think it's the thing that's preventing you from being together. Now, with that notion, that means you can never really get overcome something like fascism by kind of like directly attacking it. You want to attack the structure itself. Now, again, if you are caught in this structure, it's like being, imagine you're a hypochondriac who is scared that you have cancer. So you're a hypochondriac, you're always fearful of having cancer. Um, what's happening is you have a generalized anxiety. Maybe there's things in your past you can't look at. You're taking all of that anxiety and you're putting it onto the thing of the cancer. You're saying, I feel awful. I feel anxious because I have cancer and nobody can see it but me, right? Now imagine the hypochondriac then finds out that they have cancer. Right. They're still a hypochondriac. They're just a hypochondriac who has cancer, right? So now they feel great. They're like, I'm vindicated. I, I feel bad because I have the cancer. But they're invested in, in their cancer. So they're actually less likely to do things to get rid of it. If you're not a hypochondriac and you find out you have cancer, you're not, you're not libidinally invested in it. So you can be more proactive in getting rid of it, right? So my worry is, for example, I don't know if you ever saw with the Democratic Party, there were some people have this sign that says, love trumps hate. It was used in 2016. And I thought this is a great Freudian sign because, of course, on the surface, it means love is better than hate. And it was saying that we think Trump is hateful. <clears throat> but of course, <clears throat> the, um, the other way to read it is lo we love Trump's hate, which is this, this this hatred we mix we mix us by papers we listen to the radio all the time gives us something to live for right we are libidinally invested in in this um if that's the case then you're not you're not inclined to actually kind of try to fix something because actually at some level you're getting so much pleasure disavowed pleasure from the activity so all of that to say that i would make the argument that Human evil rests upon this desire to avoid the lack, to avoid the con contradiction. And I think our economic system is the same. We're always pursuing wholeness and completeness. And that's the very thing that destroys the environment, that gives us heart disease, that gets us bought into jobs that we despise, that gets us to envy uh, people that we look at, that fantasize that if only we got that house by the ocean, then we would be happy. And that is the very thing that we need to be freed from. We need to go through what's called an apocalyptic event. We have to experience a different way of desire, which frees us from this frenetic pursuit of wholeness. And as we engage with that, um, as individuals and as communities and as countries, we will find healthier communities and we will find less um, uh, you know, problems with, um, with kind of identitarianisms like racism and misogyny, et cetera. This seems so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to live out of two sides of my brain for a moment. I'm, I'm acknowledging all the different ways in real time. And especially given what's going on right now with uh, you know, the, the shelter in place and the social distancing and, and personally how I, I'm having to manage expectations and work through, well, if only fill in the blank, yeah. then, then I'll be okay. Or if, if I can just get this person or this environment to line up it, in whatever um, idealistic way that I think is important, almost like this puritanical way of seeing the world. And, and then I, I'm, I'm having this sort of crisis of, you know, as a leader of a community where I, I know all of us show up unconscious to the way that we're trying to create this wholeness or, 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 the, or create this idealized way of us being us at Watershed. Yeah. One of our, uh, there's this, this friend that I have in our community, his name's D. He's a part of this, this team that's trying to help us examine and interrogate our systems and our structures and our practices around the absence of diversity and inclusivity and, and the ways that maybe we're complicit to racism, sexism, a whole bunch of other isms. And one of the things that he said the first time we, we were together is this community 
uh, is really good at holding tension. It's, it's built to live in the in-between space of what, what, where we are now and where we're going. And so uh, could, you, could you speak into um, sort of what you think it means to be the church, given everything you said? Like how, do, how are communities of faith or what would you say to communities of faith who are rooted in this Christ, Christian tradition, who are rooted in some relevant idea behind uh, the cross, behind death and resurrection. What, what, what are some things that you could say to us and go, Here, here's where you need to focus your energy, or here's, 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 here's what good news means, or here's some of the work that you can be doing? I know it's a pretty broad question, but how would you respond to, to the church and who the church needs to be given everything that you've said? Yeah, so I mean, this is this is getting really to the nuts and bolts, and I'm really interested in this question. Oh, and by the way, uh, propaganda um, is nothing but the attempt to make contradiction into opposition. Propaganda is always promising wholeness and then trying to find someone to blame, and we have to avoid propaganda. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, what does this look like for the church? Now, it sounds counterintuitive at first. What I'm going to say is that, but for me, the church is the place where we experience what in philosophy is called the death of God. But it is where we experience the, where we encounter our lack, where we experience profound grace in which we do not have to fill the lack. We do not have to, so we think of church as kind of like the place you go because you want to change and you want to find wholeness and we maybe have to do a certain set of things in order to get there. But um, the idea that the church is the place in which we can confront our our lack, and I say experience this radical grace in which we do not have to change, with the weird paradox that in embracing and experience grace, experiencing grace, we, we do actually change. I mean, this is step zero in AA. I always like the idea of step zero, right? They've got the 12 steps, but before the 12 steps, you've got this radical community of grace where they just accept you for being an alcoholic. Yep, yep, we're all in the same boat. And if you don't experience, Paul Tillich, by the way, he defines grace as the acceptance that you're accepted. Because I can be accepted, but I, if I don't accept that I'm accepted, I don't feel it. But so you could be going to AA for a year and there's grace being shown, but it hasn't existentially uh, rooted itself within you. But then one week you go and you experience the acceptance. You accept the acceptance. And then you're like, I don't actually have to do anything. And then the 12 steps become useful. Like you, then you'll probably find the 12 steps are the things, very things you can do. Again, it's the Pauline thing. So what does the church look like? Okay, well, let me say this about the difference between often conservative and liberal churches. So in conservative churches, it's often about what you believe. Conservative churches very much talk about affirming a certain set of beliefs. Now, you don't have to believe them. You just have to believe that you believe them, right? Everyone questions and has thoughts. We all know the ministers don't believe half of what they're saying. And we all know that, the, you know, in the mega churches, the musicians are often hard guns just to play the music, right? We all know that, right? But we, uh, we, I'm trying not to laugh because I know my face is going to pop up, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's so freaking true. I, I don't know how to hold back my the humor side. I'm sorry, keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know it's very funny. I've, I've talked about this at length at times because it it's quite funny how it works. Um, uh, like I know quite a few pastors we all like who, are, who don't believe half of what they say because of course they don't they've been pastors for 20 years they've thought about things they're questioning the idea is simply we we affirm certain set of beliefs because it kind of kind of holds us together within a more liberal tradition you um you don't have to believe you can have doubts about everything about god and the bible all of those doubts but often if you say well can i move the altar five feet to the right it's like over my dead body right the liturgy becomes the container for the belief not the mind so it's like not believing in uh you know i don't know if you've got kids watching so i don't use that example but um there's there's certain things where a, a parent will get the enjoyment of a belief because their child believes it so they go through the the actions and whenever their child doesn't believe it, they experience the trauma of the loss of belief. Um, now, both of these are, are attempts to protect us from the trauma of encountering our doubts, unknowing, and the kind of the trauma of the conflicts of life. One is through beliefs and one is through having certain practices. For me, the church is designed 
to bring doubt, complexity and ambiguity into the heart of the structure, into the music, into the sermons, so that the congregation experience, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the point where they see a type of uh, rupture in God that helps them embrace the rupture within themselves. So this is why I think church is so, so important, because to believe is human, to doubt is divine, right? To, to question, to embrace that part of yourself takes so much work. We need, like, here's two, two liturgical structures. If you break up with somebody, there's one liturgical structure that we all know, right? You go out, you get drunk. You go to a nightclub and really loud music and like just pumping, this, like you can't hardly hear yourself think. And you, you have like superficial conversations with your friends, right? That's a liturgical structure that we engage in uh, as a solution to the problem of our suffering, right? Problem is it doesn't work. So you have to do it every week or twice a week and it gets too much. But then another liturgical structure is maybe in Ireland, you go to a pub and instead of drinking loads and getting drunk, you have a couple of pints and you talk about your week. Instead of some pop music that's all, that's all about coolness and completeness and money and da-da-da, you hear the sad singer-songwriter talking about how his one true beloved died of consumption and he'll never love again, right? And instead of superficial conversations, you have deep conversations, right? They're both the same liturgical structure, kind of, but very different. It, in the Irish pub, it helps you confront the things, the ghosts, that, that are within you, the ghost, a ghost being the, pres the presence of an absence. We're all haunted houses, right? We're all full of ghosts, people we've lost, we people we've loved, and the people who have hurt us and the people we've hurt. And in the Irish pub, you confront the ghosts. You bring that stuff up through the music, through having a drink and the conversations. In the other, you repress it all, you hide from it, you run from it. So for me, the church at its worst is like a nightclub or a crack house or whatever that you go get, get, get a drug that helps you run from the, the, the fracturedness that we are. But the church at its best is like the Irish pub. It's where you go and through the liturgy, through listening to the, 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 the sermon and the hymns, you begin to encounter that those ghosts and those things that you've repressed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, right? We want to repress the truth. We never want to encounter our truth, right? <laughs> At any, in any way. But for me, the church is about helping us encounter the truth, bringing that truth to the surface. And that in itself is transformative and uh, liberating. Mm. Mm. That's good. That's good. That's, that's the good news. That's, that's the, the gospel. Good. Life is yeah. difficult and you don't have the answers, right? So it's like, it's the good is not, you can be satisfied, come to the front and you can have everything. The good news is you're broken and that's okay. We're all broken. I'm not okay. You're not okay. That's not okay. And that's okay. Awesome. Pete Rollins, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Really appreciate it. Right after that. <laughs> um, would, uh, would love to see this again in the future. Um, just know that we're, uh, we love your work. We're rooting for you. Um, it's very clear uh, that your, your passion is so genuine. Uh, you're, you're helping people in ways that I just, I, I'm just not familiar with too many folks that are doing what you're doing. So uh, again, thank you so much. Um, have a, a, a great rest of your week and uh, continue to be safe and uh, healthy in all that the world is, is uh, being challenged with these days. We appreciate you. Have a great Thank week. You. Thank you. So, David, um, you know, to your point beginning this morning, like so much, there's so much there. Um, I, I, I don't even know if I, I have the ability to, to name the one thing other than in the, the midst of so much of what he said, it's like hope rises up. It, it sort of meets you where you are and invites you to, to begin to create a, a way forward that maybe you didn't understand or even knew existed. Um, and so, I, you know, again, like so much of how we hold the tension here in our community has been informed by his thinking. So maybe gratitude is a good way to sort of end it for me. Yeah. So for me, you know, and, and we didn't really get to, to lean into this in the way I think our community wanted to because of the pandemic happening, but at different points in, in what he was saying, uh, those, those three kind of uh, 
you know, pathway or guidepost words, value words that we introduced back earlier this year, liberation, transformation, reclamation. I kept seeing parallels between things he was saying and the values that we're trying to kind of name or identify within our community on that front. And so, I don't know, Matt, you mentioned Tuesday night, uh, you know, might be opportunity to unpack some of this stuff, maybe, maybe flesh it out a little bit on Tuesday. Yeah. I mean, if for anyone who's, who's, uh, you know, has the wherewithal to show up. I mean, I'd love to riff over this. I think, I think there's, there's, there's gotta be a hundred questions. If you're, if you're a, 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 a recovering fill in the blank, you know, evangelical Catholic, uh, you know, fundamentalist, progressive, uh, progressive. Yeah. Like there's so many, Oh geez, I need to, con- I need to ask questions about, where I'm sitting now, because I'm not sure what to do with something. I, I would, that could be really interesting. I'm, I'm excited. So you can go sign up uh, through, again, through the comments section, there's going to be a link and we'd love to see you there. So thanks. Thanks for coming this morning. Uh, peace, grace, mercy on your week and uh, uh, have a great week. Love you guys. Bye. So thank you for being here this morning and don't forget our Tuesday night Q&A. You will have a chance to come and unpack some of what you hear this morning with David and with Matt and, and the rest of our community. So if you want to do that, sign up on the links that come up. Check our website. It is updated. All these opportunities that we've discussed. Um, opportunities for generosity, opportunities for justice, opportunities for students and kids, and even some block book clubs that are coming up. So make sure that you check that out and get signed up if that's something you want to jump into. Grace and peace to all of you.